our next topic, right, that we kind of started last time, it kind of started towards the middle, um, is um, my cross B and cell structure. So remember, these go with the objectives, your study guide list. In these PowerPoints, I go over these objectives. So um, our first objective under this topic is to define the term differential stain. And the Gram stain is an example of a differential stain. A differential stain is where it helps you differentiate one group from another. So all differential stains have at least two colored dyes that are contrasting. You can tell the difference between them. And they're all going to have a decolorization step where you're going to be removing the color from one group and then that second dye is applying the color to that group. So for the Gram stain, you need to know the steps in the procedure. So what dyes are used when? What's the decolorizer? When is it used? And so we'll go through those steps. And you get two results when you do the Gram stain. You get what's re referred to as a positive result which is in fact that they stain purple and stay purple in the gram stain. So I always remember P for purple. And then your gram negative cells um, do not retain the purple stain, the crystal violet, and therefore they stain with the counter stain we use, which is saffronate. It's a red dye. But they don't hold on to a lot of the red dye, so they appear pink instead on the microscope, right? Just a lighter shade of red. So that's what the positive and negative means. It means what result you got, um, whether it stayed purple, it's positive, or it didn't stay purple, and therefore it's pink, so therefore it's gram negative. It has nothing to do with charge. It's a test you could say you run, right? Sometimes we're looking for a particular thing. Is it positive for this? Is it negative? In this case, did it stay purple or did it not? Make sense? So we're, hopefully you guys have already looked at the Gram stain animation, right? You hopefully know where it is on our Canvas site now, so you can reference it later. I am going to play it, um, and it is a YouTube link, so it embeds even in our Canvas course. I'm probably going to mute the audio, though, and do my own voiceover for it. Um, so that way you guys have kind of two representations. Um, and again, um, for some of us, right, seeing things in motion really helps us in our understanding of it, right? So when I can, I try to incorporate things like animations and videos um, into our lectures. The reason why we get these different results has to do with the cell wall structures of these two different cell types that we have discovered through gram staining. The ones that stay purple versus the ones that don't stay purple, the gram negatives. So we'll look at that right down to the structural level, right? So that in the animation they talk about and we look at the different common cell wall structures. And then this is as it relates to bacteria, okay? So I'm going to link out, go back to our canvas, and I'm going to link out to this, but I'm going to mute her, <laughs> um, and I'm going to make it big. So this particular stain they did had both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms on it, right? So I actually want to rewind for a second and pause on that picture. So you can see the purple ones, as I indicated, positive and negative. You can somewhat, this is not the best picture, but you can somewhat see shapes of the organisms. Remember last time we kind of talked about shapes? Do you see how that one's kind of spherical? Right? The purple ones, what's the term that we use for that? Coxus, if we're talking about one, and if we're talking about all of the, the spherical, cocci. Right? And this one, can you kind of see? They're rod shaped, or what would be the proper term? Bacillus, and if we're talking about more than one? Bacilli. Good, you guys have been studying. Good, good, good. All right, and you can see that in this case, um, that one's those came out pink. Um, it's not the shape of the cell that determines this color, though. It's the actual cell wall structure that we'll look at. But remember, the cell wall is what helps them hold these unique shapes that we do see um, for bacteria and um, prokaryotes in general. So. I have to hit the right play button. So when in microbiology lab, when we're making bacterial smears, we're applying bacteria to the slide. 
Um, you need liquid to get it to spread out. So depending on whether you have a liquid culture or not a liquid culture, you might need to add some type of liquid to allow you to spread them out. Then we heat fix them, which kills them. But the main reason we do that is to get them to stick to the slide, right? And so we just pass it through the Bunsen burner, right through the heat for a few seconds. I usually do like a five count, um, and that's enough. And so they'll stick to the slide so that when you go to stain and you're rinsing off your stains, you're not rinsing off your organisms, right? You need them to be stuck to the slide. Um, so once you have a heat fix slide, you can gram stain it. The first stain that's used is um, crystal violet. And the standard one minute rule in microbiology works best um, for staining procedures. Um, different ones will have different times, but one minute is usually not too long and not too short. And then you can see here, right, after you do the crystal violet, all the cells, notice even the, the ones that end up being pink later, are purple if you were to stop there and look at them under the microscope. So all the cells get stained with the crystal violet, with that primary stain. The difference is some of them aren't going to stay purple, right? We're going to remove that purple dye. So we rinse with um, distilled or deionized water. Then we apply iodine, or sometimes referred to as Graham's iodine. The color doesn't change here. They're still going to be purple, and all of them are still going to be purple. But this is an important step at the molecular level, because something happens between the crystal violet and the iodine. They actually bind to each other and we get a switch out of ions. And so um, it becomes a much larger molecule. Now we have crystal violet and iodine combined inside those cells. Right? And that's a crucial step to the crystal violet iodine complex staying in some of these cells, what we call gram positive. So then our next step is to decolorize. And this has to be done a particular way um, so that you don't over decolorize, but you decolorize to an, uh, enough extent. Acetone could be used, but we don't use that anymore because it's any ladies that out there get your nails done, right? You know about acetone. It's highly volatile. Um, it damages mucous membranes. It's not a cool substance to work with. Ethanol, alcohol, right, is a really good decolorizer, so we use that instead. And it's added dropwise in a particular way, right? And if you're taking a lab class or you want to know, watch my other YouTube video that shows you um, when you should really um, stop decolorizing, when it just gets light purple, not completely clear. Then we rinse with water, and at this point, this is the important differential step, is that now the gram positives, right, have retained that crystal violet iodine complex, they're still purple. The gram negatives, we've removed the diiodine complex and they are now colorless at this step, if you were to stop right now. The problem with that is you want to be able to see them, right? And if they're colorless, they're transparent, you're not going to see them. One of the main reasons we stain bacteria is to be able to visualize them. And when we're, do when we're doing a stain like the Gram stain, it actually even tells us additional information. It tells us the cell wall structure. So in this case, we want to see them. So we're going to stain one more time with a dye. And in this case, it's safranin, which is actually a red dye. But these cells have been damaged um, in the removal of the crystal violet iodine, so they have big holes in them. So they're not able to absorb a lot of the dye, and so they appear pink instead of red under the microscope. So there we have pink ones and purple ones, right? The pink ones are the negative ones. They were decolorized and restained. Now, oh, I'm going to pause here so it doesn't go past the picture for me. So gram-positive cells, all cells are going to have a cell membrane, right? So this is represented here by the phospholipid bilayer, right, and the proteins embedded in it that work as receptors and channels, right, for that cell to respond to its environment, to bring stuff in and out, to provide integrity to, to that membrane. Outside of that would be the cell wall. A cell wall for bacteria is made out of a special substance. Do you guys remember what? It's a defining characteristic of the domain bacteria. It's peptidoglycan, 
right? So we're going to look at the specifics of this molecule, right? Um, and that's what this is. This is that molecular structure that we call peptidoglycan. It's made up of sugars and um, some amino acids, and it creates this nice rigid structure, very much like a brick wall. But unlike a brick wall, this one has gaps in it. So I sometimes equate it to um, a wicker basket, right? You can stick your Easter eggs in that, right? But you're certainly not going to put any water in it. So we go out the little tiny holes, right? So it can hard, it, it's rigid, right? Just like a cell wall is rigid. So it can maintain a structure. It can hold stuff, but it's going to let stuff in and out. And of course, that has to happen for a cell to survive, right? You don't want a barrier that's completely impenetrable. Then the cell wouldn't be able to survive. It wouldn't be able to get nutrients in and waste out. So there are, there are gaps. And so the crystal violet goes through those gaps and can enter into the cells. Okay. And then, of course, remember the cells are dead when we're staining them, right? So this helps to facilitate, too, the movement into the cell. And then the iodine goes in, and as I said, those two molecules bond together. Then the next step is decolorization, right, with alcohol. And one of the reasons why when you use those hand sanitizers, they contain alcohol. That's, that's the sanitizing agent. That's what's um, potentially um, disrupting bacterial membranes and destroying them. But it also strips your own lipids um, associated with your cells. Um, so that's why it tends to dry out your hands. So... For here, though, the effect, because peptidoglycan is mostly sugar, it's this really interesting effect where it shrinks that layer, right? It shrinks it up, kind of dries it up, and those holes that were once relatively large become much smaller in, in between the molecules in the peptidoglycan. So it really helps trap in that crystal violet iodine. But as I said, it can affect membranes, too. And so when you decolorize too much, you start disrupting the membrane, and even these guys will decolorize because it just gets really disrupted. So gram-negative bacteria, on the other hand, have a little bit different structural makeup. So there's our peptidoglycan. And you can see they're trying to show it kind of shrinking. <laughs> And the crystal violet iodine is attaching to each other, right? So larger molecule, a little bit harder to get out of the cell. So for our gram negatives, and I'll pause here. Maybe I'll wait till those guys go through. All right. So for every cell, they got to have a cell membrane or cytoplasmic membrane or cellular membrane, whatever you want to call it. For gram negatives, They'll have usually a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. And the problem with that is not a thick enough layer to trap in the crystal violet iodine. The other thing is they typically have an outer membrane, an additional membrane. This additional membrane on the outermost covering is very easily damaged by the ethanol. Remember I said it dissolves lipids, right? And so it's going to disrupt this membrane. And these membranes will have connections <coughs> And again, that's not enough peptidoglycan to hold this stuff in. So these guys become very porous. The crystal violet iodine complex gets washed out. And so now they're colorless. We've got to counter stain them with the safranin so that you can actually see them under the microscope. So this, because of how this procedure works, right, gives us a clue in to something you can't see under the microscope, right? You can't see to this level with a light microscope. But being able to see whether it's purple or pink will tell you whether, especially for the gram positives, that you've got that really thick peptidoglycan layer. Now, for gram negatives, you probably have this structure when you're talking about bacteria. But the other problem is, is that some cells don't even have peptidoglycan at all, right? So they can't even trap in the crystal violet iodine. They're going to get decolorized. They're going to end up pink. And so there's a few exceptions um, in the bacterial world where it doesn't even have a cell wall at all, and so therefore it comes out gram-negative. No peptidoglycan at all. So remember, these guys, what's their problem, too, is when we, as far as shape goes, if they don't have a cell wall. Do they have a consistent shape? Now, last time we referred to those as being pleomorphic. 
Anybody remember the genus name for our ones that are pleomorphic? What genus of bacteria? Myco for the fact that they kind of stretch out and look like fungi, right? Plasma referring to the fact that they just have a plasma membrane. All right, so I'm going to close out of this. And so what structure present in bacterial cell walls causes the difference between re the results that we see in this procedure? What would we say? For bacteria, peptidoglycan. Right? And, of course, I didn't put the answer on this one. <sighs> I'll get there eventually. All right. So this is a diagram, right, showing the steps and showing the differences that would happen. And, again, even notice this rod-shaped one stayed purple. It has nothing to do with shape. Right, has everything to do with that cell wall structure. So what we know about this procedure, we could hypothesize what um, human cells would come out. You could stain any cell. You could stain a protozoa cell, you can stain archaea, and you're going to either get purple or pink, depending on how the structural <coughs> structures present in that cell interact with these dyes in this procedure. So we know that what traps in the crystal violet iodine for bacteria, peptidoglycan. And that's the substance that their cell wall is made out of, right? That's the chemical substance, that molecular complex that bacteria have. Bacteria only, right? So do we have it? No. Do we even have cell walls? No, right? So are we going to trap in the crystal violet iodine? No. So our cells don't. They decolorize, and so they end up being pink, right? So you're gram negative. <coughs> so four dyes... When we do staining, we use different types of dyes, and they're going to interact with cells differently. Crystal violet is what's referred to as a basic dye. It has a positive charge. It's attracted to the negative components, your uh, proteins and your DNA. Your DNA is highly negative charge within the cells. So crystal violet goes in. So notice, I mean, it's inside the cell. It colors the inside of the cell, and that's because of the type of dye it is that it's a basic positively charged dye. So as we said, gram positive, gram negatives, doesn't matter this first step, everybody gets stained purple. The iodine <coughs> step, there's no change in color, right? Notice everybody's purple. But what is happening is the crystal violet and iodine are binding to each other and making a much larger complex. The decolorization step is your differential step. It's going to give us those different groups. And so the gram negatives become decolorized. The crystal violet iodine gets washed out of them because the uh, ethanol or the decolorizer damages that, me that membrane structure. There's not enough peptidoglycan in there to trap it in. There's a thin layer, if any at all, and it gets washed out, and they become colorless at this step. Gram positive, if done right, should stay purple because the crystal violet iodine gets trapped in by the shrinking of that peptidoglycan layer. And it's very thick for gram positives. You know, it could be as many as 30 layers thick of this substance. We want to see the gram negatives though, so now we're going to stain with safranin. This is another basic dye, so it goes inside the cells. Again, big holes in the gram negatives, so it doesn't trap a lot of the red dye and they end up pink. <coughs> Your gram positives get stained with the red dye too, but they're still going to appear purple, right? So probably my best understanding of dyeing things is laundry, right? So if you stick, and I've done this, right, accidentally when I was a kid, teenager in charge of laundry in my household, right? We had so many people that we literally had a whites pile and a colors pile, and I, one of the red socks got into the whites. 
So my dad had white undershirts, right, that became pink because the red sock got in and bled all over, right? So for a little while, <laughs> until we bleached it out, he had pink underwear. Uh, He's a, he was a pretty cool guy. He was okay with it. <laughs> he wasn't too mad about it. It was an undershirt, right? Nobody really sees that under your shirt. So um, I love my husband, though, because I can't make that mistake. All, all his underwear are black, right? So I can throw it in with anything, and anything bleeds, you're not going to see it, right? Because it's a darker color. And that's the case here with that purple, right? If it had been purple underwear, right, and I threw in a red sock, you probably wouldn't even notice that either one bled on the other, right, that the colors, right, were released by the washing process and then picked up by the other fabrics. Make sense? Okay. So the, the colors that we use and the steps and the order we use is very important because if you were to do this the opposite way, you'd end up with light purple and dark purple cells. That would be fun trying to determine, right? <laughs> so you want contrasting colors. You want to be able to differentiate them from one another um, and um, really tell the differences. So another analogy that I use to help people visualize <coughs> what's happening inside these cells is how many of you guys have seen this toy? Right. Um, so this is a kid's toy. It has blocks that go in these little holes. You can see them inside the toy. And they just barely fit into these um, slots for the different shapes. Um, once you put them in, there's a handle here at the top and the bottom. Notice that there are two halves. You can open this up and the blocks come back out. Um, but little kids, unless you show them this, don't realize it. And so they put all the little blocks in. And of course, they want to do it again. So what do they do? They stick their little hand in one of these holes and then they grab onto a block and they try to take it out. Can they get it out? No, they're sitting there screaming because their hand is stuck until you convince them to let go of the block and take their cute little hand back out the hole, right? So just like with the crystal violet iodine, crystal violet goes in, iodine goes in, right? But then they combined, so it's harder to get them out. And it's even harder because the holes shrink when we decolorize, right? Can you imagine the poor little kid sticking his hand in, right? Barely gets the hand in, barely gets the block in. Now you're going to try and take both out at the same time? Not happening. And then the hole shrinks on top of your hand? You really have a screaming kid, right? So um, they just, they once they go in and combine, you're not going to get them back out, right? It's too difficult, right? to have those two things. So here's your intelligent quiz for this morning, right? See if you guys can handle it. How do you get that ball out the hole at the top? It won't fit right now, why? Because those pegs in there. Do you think you could remove the pegs? You could remove the pegs, right? Take the ball out. <laughs> How do you think they got it in? The ball went in, then the pegs went in, just like the crystal violet went in, and then the iodine went in, and we got this bigger molecule, and you're not going to get it out the little tiny hole. Make sense? Okay. So, why do we have cell walls? Where are they located? Well, we kind of already got a preview to that, right? Where are they located? Inside the cell or outside the cell? How many people say inside? Inside. The membrane defies the cell, and it was outside. So they're always outside the cell. Okay. And even with the gram negatives that have two membranes, that's still considered outside the cell because it's the cell membrane that defines the cell. So we'll look at that more closely. We already kind of clued into its functionality. <coughs> what does it help the cell do? hold the shape, right? And it has an additional very important stru uh, structural ability in helping the cells with osmotic pressure. We know under certain <coughs> osmotic conditions, right, like a hypertonic solution, what would happen to our cells because we don't have cell walls? They'd burst because the water comes rushing in, right, and pops them. Well, these are unicellular organisms living in environments that, you know, sometimes you have fluctuations in osmotic pressure. If you don't have protection against this, you're going to burst. And in the case of these cells, they're unicellular, right? 
You just died. <laughs> you don't have any cells to spare like we do, right? You're dead. <coughs> so you certainly don't want that happening. What is it made out of, right? So we've said this substance, a peptidoglycan, but we're going to go a little bit more detail. What is it made out of? Right? And so we'll look in what are the similarities and differences between these different structures and who has them. So who's got peptidoglycan? Well, pretty much all bacteria. <coughs> but we have differences between gram-positive and negatives as we've seen, right? Gram-positives have a lot of it. Gram-negatives have little to none, depending on the cell. Who's got the tectoic, teco uh, tectoic acids? Who's got the outer membrane? What is lipopolysaccharide, which is abbreviated here LPS? What are porin proteins? And where is the periplasm, right? And who's got these things? So the cell wall, as we've seen, is rigid. It helps provide shape. It surrounds the cytoplasmic membrane, right? So it's outside of the cell. It determines the shape of the bacteria. It holds the cell together and prevents the cell from bursting. It has a very unique chemical structure, right, that we call peptidoglycan. And again, it's going to help us distinguish between gram-positives and gram-negatives. And notice I even color-coded it, right? So we start remembering. Positive, purple, gram-negative is pink. So this substance is only found in bacteria. So if you talk about prokaryotes, right, um, archaea have something different. Uh, but in this class, we're, we're mostly focusing on human pathogens. Archaea really are not. So we're sticking to just bacteria. So they're made up, this substance, peptidoglycan, gets its name from the fact that it's made up of, of sugars. Glycan stands for sugars. Um, two alternating sugars, N-acetyl glucamic glucosamine, and then N-acetyl muric acid. The good news is you don't have to spell these <laughs> or say them. Um, you just have to recognize them. Um, so they're commonly abbreviated NAG and NAM. And their structure is alternating. So one sugar, then the next sugar, right? So imagine Mardi Gras beets, right? <coughs> alternating colors. Those chains, and again, think about this almost like a net even over the cell, right? Just all these sugars alternating, creating this covering, this sugar coat, almost like a jawbreaker, right? And so each layer of these sugars, though, is connected to each other by amino acids. Amino acids, when they bind with each other, form what's called a peptide bond. So that's where this molecule gets its name, right, peptidoglycan. Right? So we have peptides, amino acids, bonding together these two sugar layers. And as I said, many sugar <coughs> layers. For gram positives, they have an additional peptide bridge here. And again, it's because they tend to have so many layers of peptidoglycan. I mean, they'll have 30 plus layers of this molecule. That's one big jawbreaker. <laughs> and so sometimes this, this um, string of amino acids is referred to as a tetrapeptide because tetra means four, right? There are four of them. So we zoom in and we're to look at the sugar structure here for these two sugars. You'll see that common sugar structure here with the additional components to them. So here's a little zoomed in view, right? So you see that glycan chain, the alternating sugars, the tetrapeptide, and then for the gram positives, they have an additional linkage, right? More support. More mortar, you could say, between the bricks, holding it all together. So gram positives have that relatively thick layer of peptidoglycan. It can be as many as 30 layers. Regardless of thickness, peptidoglycan is permeable to numerous substances, right? Stuff goes in and out. has to, otherwise the cell wouldn't survive. 
In addition, for gram positives, they have tectoic acid that's associated with the peptidyl glycan. And this actually gives the cell itself an overall negative charge. So you'll see here in this diagram, right, we have the cell membrane and then multiple layers of um, peptidyl glycan. And then the little <laughs> red things here are representing the tachoic acid. There's an electron micrograph, right, so a really high-powered electron microscope. You can see the cytoplasmic membrane and this thick peptidyl glycan layer. And then, of course, this is just a a drawing representation of the two layers and their location. So when you actually look at that under, under a microscope, that's what it looks like. An electron microscope, yes. Not a light microscope. You're not going to see that level of detail using a light microscope. The light microscope, we can infer that it looks like this when it comes out purple in the gram stain. <laughs> So gram-negative tend to be much more complex than gram-positives. If they have a layer of peptidoglycan, it's usually a very thin layer. And it's sandwiched between their outer membrane and their cytoplasmic membrane. That region where the peptidoglycan is found is called the periplasm. And a lot of the secreted proteins, is almost like a storage area outside the cell for gram negatives, they'll have a lot of other substances um, that they have in that space, in that periplasm space. But it is considered an external environment to the cell. So for gram negatives, much more complicated. They have their cell membrane which defines the cell. Then outside the cell, they have this space between another membrane called the outer membrane. That's nice and easy, right? Outermost covering, outer membrane. <coughs> and then if they have it, right, in between here it would be the peptidoglycan in this periplasm space, as well as other substances they may store there. But when you look at this outer membrane, it looks really different on the top, right? from the plasma membrane. You have two phospholipid bilayers here for a cell membrane. For the outer membrane, <laughs> the outer leaflet here is made of a substance called lipopolysaccharides. So it's lipid components, just like your phospholipids, but it has, instead of having the phosphate head here, it has a lipid A component, and then it has polysaccharides, sugars, that are sticking out these long tails. This is another really added layer of protection for gram negatives. Gram negative cells are pretty hard to penetrate. Um, and because it's hard for stuff to get through, they have specialized proteins called porin proteins in this outer membrane that literally open up pores so that stuff can head through that outer membrane um, and then through the periposm space and into the cell if necessary. And then, of course, stuff can get out that way as well. Notice they still have receptors embedded in their um, membrane. And again, most of these guys are transport proteins, right, moving stuff across the, the <coughs> normal membrane. So this is of significance um, in the medical field for us because this layer can be very toxic um, for us, unfortunately. Those molecules are not good news. So we're going to identify and explain the molecular importance of the parts of the molecule lipopolysaccharide, commonly abbreviated LPS, found in the outer leaflet, as you saw, just that outer layer of the outer membrane. So it's still a lipid bilayer, like most cytoplasmic membranes, but that outer leaflet is different, right? It's lipopolysaccharides as opposed to phospholipids. It creates a barrier, right, to a large number of molecules, and so they have to have those specialized um, porin <coughs> proteins to open up channels for stuff to travel in and out. Of medical significance is that O-specific polysaccharide side chain 
And so remember when I mentioned E. coli, that strain of E. coli, and I said O157? It's identified by a specific set that they've denoted this number designation, 157, to those sugars, right? The O refers to opposite of the lipid A component, but it refers to those sugars, right? And what sugars they have, right, that potential pathogenic strain of E. coli we can actually identify based on what sugars it has in its lipopolysaccharide. The lipid A component, right, which were those little squares that you saw, I didn't switch to my next slide, <laughs> are toxic to us. It's an endotoxin. When these cells die or when these cells are broken up or when we destroy them by our immune system, the unfortunate things is that they, these are toxic. So the presence of this in our blood will show a gram-negative type infection. And this is also why, unfortunately, even with treatment, um, people will sometimes still die from gram-negative infections when they've gone what we call septic, when they've got into the bloodstream and they're widespread. Because um, there's just so much of this toxin that we can't um, combat that problem um, that it causes. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. So gram negatives are, are really, unfortunately, can be quite additionally bad for us when it comes to bacterial infections of these type of bacteria. Because their membranes, when broken up, are toxic to us. They're out of the membrane anyways. So we've briefly talked about penicillin, right? It's an antibiotic. It's produced by a fungus against bacteria, right? They're fighting over food resources. Lysozyme is an enzyme that our bodies produce. And we have it lots of different places like in our tears and our saliva. Both of these substances... <coughs> can affect peptidoglycan, but they affect it in different ways. But both are damaging to peptidoglycan. So both of them will damage bacteria that have peptidoglycan. So we're going to explain why gram-negative bacteria are typically less susceptible than gram-positive to penicillin and lysozyme, which hopefully you should already know, right? What's the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative as it applies to peptidoglycan? Gram positive, they have that really thick layer, right? That's what traps in the crystal violet iodine. Gram negatives, if they've got it, they've got very little, right? So not very affected by something damaging that substance. Where your gram positives are very dependent, right, for their protection against osmotic pressure, for having that layer of peptidoglycan, those layers upon layers, I should say, of peptidoglycan. So it's structurally, right, how much peptidoglycan they have that is why they are more susceptible gram-positives than gram-negatives. There's a genus of bacteria that lack a cell wall. <coughs> and those are our, do you guys remember from earlier? Myco, mycoplasmas, right? So if they don't have a cell wall, they don't have peptidoglycan, right? So is penicillin or lysozyme going to affect them? No, because those two substances affect peptidoglycan. If you don't have peptidoglycan, these aren't going to negatively affect you. Anybody remember the pneumonia that's caused by a mycoplasma? <coughs> Walking pneumonia, right? The mild, a relatively milder form of pneumonia. You can't give them penicillin. It's not going to do any good, right? That bacteria doesn't have a cell wall. <coughs> so, as we said, penicillin's an antibiotic, right? It's produced naturally by fungi. It interferes with the synthesis of peptidoglycan. It goes into the cells. So that's another problem even for, for gram negatives. Remember, in order to get into that cell, how many layers does it have to get through? It's got to get through the outer membrane, travel through that periplasmin space, and then 
the other membrane, the cell membrane. And remember that outer membrane doesn't really like to let stuff through. Right? So one of the reasons why peptidoglycan doesn't isn't very why penicillin isn't very effective against the peptidoglycan if it even has it in gram negatives is trouble even getting into the cell. Right? It's got to actually travel into the cell and interfere with that cell's ability to make the peptidoglycan layer. This is also why it's most effective against cells that are growing, right? Because cells that are growing are increasing their cell wall and their membranes and they're splitting into two cells. And so when they do this and they don't make a structurally sound cell wall, guess what happens? Poof, they burst. Right? And that's how we kill them. Lysozymes different. So right down to the structural level for, let me scroll back to a peptidoglycan. So it interferes with them making these bridges, right? So they make these components inside their cells, they transport it outside, and they build their little walls, right? And so they're stacking up their bricks, right, their sugars, and then they want to hook them together with those proteins, with those amino acid bridges. Problem is, is that penicillin stops them from doing that. So they end up with this wall, right, with no mortar. So you just basically push it over, right? The cells just explode when they're under any type of pressure. Am I doing on time? Getting close. Okay. So lysozyme, as I said, found in our tears and saliva. This is an enzyme. So this works a little bit differently. It literally can attach to the peptidoglycan, and it's going to break apart those two sugars those alternating sugars. So I mean it literally is breaking up bricks. It's serious. And again, easily can get to it for gram negatives. It's a little more difficult, right? They gotta go through that outer membrane and get into that peripasm space. It can get there, right? It can cause some destruction to them, but gram positives are much more susceptible, right? That Those layers of a peptidoglycan are right on the outside, and this enzyme just goes to chewing them up. So what's similar about both of these, right, would be they both weaken the cell wall. They just go about it differently. Ultimately, they're going to lead to cell lysis and cell death. What's the difference is how they actually work, right? Peptidoglycan goes in and interferes with the cell's ability to structurally make peptidoglycan. Where lysozyme, it just goes in and destroys the wall, right? So it, it'll it work on growing or non-growing cells, right? Because it's just going to attack the peptidoglycan that's already there. Okay. So um, most of you guys, have, uh, there's one person hasn't registered for their Connect. If you need help, come see me. But not today, because remember, i got to run too. Um, but I was here early, um, and I can be early on, on Friday if you need help.